So last time we started working on the um, central force two-body problem and we were able to uh, reduce a problem that looked like this with oops. Okay. Uh, with a vector r like this uh, and two vectors r1, r2, this one will go to the center of mass and we were able to reduce this problem to <coughs> essentially a one body problem. So that The Lagrangian of the system looked like this. Where mu was the reduced mass, oh, because mine is the, the potential, which is a function of R only. So we're going to um, continue with this. We're gonna look at the angular momentum, so L, vector L rather than script L. Um, do you think that in this situation the angular momentum will be conserved? Yes or no? Are you guys there? Pedro, is the angular momentum going to be conserved? I think so. Yeah, it should be conserved. Why? Can you give me an example in which we have a central potential and the angular momentum is conserved? Marcos. Yes. Can you give me an example in which the angular momentum will be conserved? It's a central potential, central force. All right, so um, let's say that R is in this direction. And you know, P uh, is in this direction. So the velocity. In which direction is the angular momentum? Will be coming out of the plane, right?
we can think about the sun uh, earth motion so it's going to look like that if we want to see it in a little bit in perspective The sun over here, earth over here, this is r, the velocity will be tangential and so the angular momentum is in this direction. So is the angular momentum of the earth-sun system being conserved? Well, yes, obviously. Otherwise, the uh, the velocity of the Earth, you know, will be decreasing or increasing the uh, the velocity around the Sun, right? And we know that it takes uh, one year to do one revolution. It is not changing very dramatically. So whenever we have this kind of uh, of situation two masses in space um, interacting gravitationally, for the most part, the angular momentum is going to be conserved. Um, in fact, you know, it is so general because there's no torque, right? That when you have an accretion disk, for example, right? So you have um, you know, some mass on the uh, outside um, and more mass on the inside is more dense. Uh, it's going to be rotating slowly outside, a little faster inside. And as it starts to coalesce, it's going to start rotating faster and faster. Right? So angular momentum is conserved. In fact, um, you can be a little bit more extreme you can have a supernova explosion, right? Um, it explodes, so the material goes outside um, radially. And so whatever remains needs to maintain all the angular momentum. It's much smaller, and so it's going to be rotating like crazy, right? And you get a, a pulsar. So yes, angular momentum is very common, that is conserved. Um, if there are no external torques, then it will be conserved. <coughs> so the system is um, spherically symmetric. You know, the potential is um, just a function of R. So uh, it's going to be the same um, in this direction. If you go around in a plane, it is going to be the same. And if you go you know, uh, in this direction also, so that you get the whole sphere, you still you know, get uh, the same. So it is spherically symmetric. It is easiest you know, uh, mathematically to take the plane in which you have R and the angular momentum, um, so that you know, that with the plane, so that the angular momentum is perpendicular to that. So uh, this angular, uh, I mean this Lagrangian, is a function of r, theta, r dot, and theta dot. Going to be one half mu r dot squared plus r square theta dot squared um, minus the potential. So because this is identical to the one body problem, you know we're going to use m rather than mu, but. You know, be mindful that it's the same. Uh, since the angular momentum 
is conserved, we're going to have the uh, partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to beta is zero. We can see it over here. We have no dependence on theta. Okay, so we know what kind of situation this Lagrangian, this one body problem represents. We can always think about gravitational potential and uh, a mass orbiting around a more massive one. So the Lagrangian is in general, is the kinetic energy minus the potential. So one half of the mass um, r dot squared. And I guess now I can um, ignore the vector part. Now this is a generalized coordinate. Then we have this other part. Oops. Ugly handwriting. So the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot have uh, this part over here so it's going to be one half of m r squared theta dot squared so that's one half of m r squared times two theta dot we can get rid of the twos so we get m r squared theta dot. The other, um, his canonical coordinate will be partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta, and we know that this one is equal to zero. It's a cyclic variable. So the Lagrange equation for the theta degree of freedom is going to be, I guess in general, is d dt partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qj dot minus partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qj equals zero. So. Um, in this case, this part is zero. So we have that this part, the derivative with respect to time of mr squared theta dot is equal to zero. So we can uh, move the dt over here. and then integrate on both sides. And this one is of course still zero. But here, uh, we can get rid of these uh, derivative. So we get this one, you know, plus some constant of integration. Um, this is a constant, so we can just move it to this side, right? And this one in particular, we're going to call script lowercase l. It's a constant. And is the value of the angular momentum of the system. OK, 
Okay, so we're gonna be using these um, quite a bit in the next few minutes. So I'm going to put it over here. It is equation 3.8. Goldstein. So just for fun, because we can, we are going to derive Kepler's second law. You remember which one uh, it is, Kepler's second law? What is the first law? Kepler's first law. Did you guys learn this in elementary school? Come on, don't be shy. Homero. Um, I know it has to do something with planets. Okay. Um, do you know about something related to the area that they cover in time? Correct. So the first one says that um, that planets move in uh, ellipses around you know, the other, the more massive body. And the second one says that they cover the same area. So the, the vector R covers the same area in the same amount of time. So if we have the theta over here. Right, so I guess um, this is a more exaggerated one. I guess this could be the two foci of the ellipse. And you know what we observe, for example, in the solar system, the two foci are very, very close to each other. So the orbits are almost circular, um, but you know if they're more eccentric, it'll look like that. And so that means that uh, over here, you know, we have this all this area, which seems to be a lot. Um, if you know the object moves this in you know, one day, um, that means that over here, in the same amount of time, one day, the area has to be the same, right? So maybe we'll look more like this. So that means that the objects move cl uh, faster if they're closer to the object, to the, you know, the more massive object. Um, yeah, Kepler thought that the orbits of the planets could be assigned to um, how are these solids called? Like the cube, uh, dodecahedron, like all of these that can be formed with perfect um, uh, shapes, like you know the square or the um, pentagon and hexagon. Anyways, he was disappointed. At the end of his life, he realized that they were circular. Well, first he thought they were circular, and it was even more imperfect than that. They're actually ellipses. But anyways, sensitivities aside. Mm, 
say that this is a uh, part of an orbit. So this one will move from oops. From here, you know, this is R, and it is going to move uh, an angle uh, d theta. So, if d theta is very small, then this side over here is um, approximately R d theta, right? It's a very small um, sine function. Um, so if the angle is very small, uh, the value of the side is almost um, x. So this area over here is going to be one half because it's a triangle. Um, the base will be r, and the height will be r d theta. So the rate of change of the area, dA dt, is constant. That is um, the second law. So the derivative with respect to time this will be um, dA, right? So I'm going to put the r squared over here. One half. This is dA. So the derivative with respect to time of that number or that quantity um, r doesn't depend on time, but Theta does, so we can put it in here. So that is um, one half of r squared theta dot, and theta dot is L. divided by m r squared. So this is equal to one half uh, of L divided by m. So L is the angular momentum the magnitude, m is the mass, we know that both of them are constant, and so we get that the rate of change of the area is equal to one half L over m. So, yep, we recover Kepler's second law from the um, from Lagrange's equation, which is nice. So there's another equation of motion. You know, the first one was for theta. The next one is for what? What is the other degree of freedom? like a pirate. Partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to r dot is going to be um, I'm 
going to write it very quickly again, was one half mr dot squared plus r squared theta squared uh, minus vr. So we have uh, this term over here. So it's going to be one half of m and then times two r dot. So we get rid of these and it's just m r dot. And then we have the other one. So with respect to r, and that one is going to be one half of m theta dot squared. All of this was a constant. And then we have the r squared, so it's times two r. And again, we get rid of the twos, and then we have the potential, right? So we don't know the form of the potential, but we can just put it here um, generically. So the equation of motion, um, the, the Lagrange equation is derivative with respect to t of m r dot minus m theta dot squared um, r minus the derivative of the potential with respect to r equals zero. So we can put this one on the other side. So it'll be equal to the partial derivative of the potential with respect to r. And we're gonna call that one just f of r. This is a force. Um, so here we have the mr dot dot. Right. And I get rid of the Um, theta dot again, but theta dot is L over MR squared. So theta dot squared, this one, is this one squared. So here we have MR dot dot minus MR L squared over M squared R to the fourth equals F of R. So we can get rid of this mass and this mass. One R over here and this will be R cubed. This is uh, L squared divided by M R cubed. Okay, so we get our second order differential equation. So for this system in general, how many, <coughs> we have theta and we have r, how many uh, differential equations should we expect and what order? Two Lagrangians, equation. Two, and there should be second order, right? Um, we have some constants of integration already because the angular momentum was conserved. And we have another one. 
So this one is equation 3.12. In Goldstein. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, I'm gonna erase uh, everything. What is the other quantity that is conserved in this system? You learn this in <clears throat> your um, middle school, maybe high school physics. What quantities are conserved? The energy? Yes, the energy. So, before, I guess last time, we defined the energy function, small little h. It's the sum over the indices of qj dot partial derivative of the Lagrangian respect to qj dot minus the Lagrangian. So we know that uh, you know, the qj's are going to be, or qj dot is going to be um, theta dot and r dot. So h is going to be r dot partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to r dot plus theta dot partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta dot minus the Lagrangian. Um, we'll resolve this one and this one. So I'll just rewrite them. R dot, this one was mr dot. And this one was mr squared theta dot. And the Lagrangian, we wrote it before, one half of m um, r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared uh, plus the potential. The plus is because we have a negative here. So this one is negative and then this one becomes positive. So we can group uh, the, the terms. This is gonna be one half uh, of m uh, r dot squared, so this one. <coughs> Uh, plus um, r square theta dot square uh, plus v r. So here we have um, one m r dot squared. And then we subtract this one, the one half m r dot squared. So we have one half and the same thing over here with the theta dot. So this is the energy function, you know, just from the definition. And well, this is of course the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The conservation, um, well, I guess the, the derivative that we had was 
derivative of the energy function with respect to time is equal to negative partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time. And we know that the Lagrangian doesn't vary with respect to time. You know, we're not changing the strength of the gravitational force. Um, that would be a cool thing to do, but it doesn't happen in the universe. So you know, this is just equal to zero. So that means that the energy function is a constant, right? So uh, E, which is T plus V, is a constant. So theta dot, remember that, um, well, theta dot squared is equal to um, L squared over uh, M squared R fourth. So we can plug it in there. We will get um, right, so maybe we can separate them over here. Um, H is one half M R dot squared uh, plus one half, then we can get rid of this uh, M. Um, it will be one half L squared over M R cubed. I'm sorry, squared. Plus V is constant. And this one, I derived it differently than in the book, but it is equation 3.15. I think this way is easier than um, what they do in, in the textbook. Okay, so we have, um, essentially this gave us another uh, uh, constant of integration. So in general, we're going to have two second order differential equations. So we'll need four integrations. We, the angular momentum um, conservation and the energy conservation, we have performed two integrations and so we have another two to do. So um, I guess this one I'm just going to call it E. going to solve for r dot. So E um, minus V minus L squared over two M R squared
it's equal to that. So I'm just going to multiply this times 2 divided by m. And then I'm going to take the square root of this. And that's equal to r dot. So this is dr dt. So this one depends um, <coughs> only on r, right? And so dt is equal to dr divided by this quantity. So we can integrate on both sides. And this will be from zero to T asterisk. This one will be from R naught to R asterisk. And this one is equation 3.18. So it looks pretty nasty, and in fact, uh, it is in general very nasty. But the solution over here is going to be the time as a function of the the radius and it's going to be a function of r um, r not the constant of integration e and l so constant 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 and um, variable So over here, we're going to have a function of r. So in principle, we can invert it. So we can get r as a function of the time. And so it will be a function of the time r not e and l so pretty nasty but math doesn't preclude us from doing it so once we have this r since we have um, this equation Um, L we can get this one d theta dt it will be L divided by m r squared and this one is the one that we're getting from here so we do the same thing we move the dt and we integrate so we can get theta in terms of theta naught <coughs> and the time interval so obviously we're not solving this um, in any particular uh, way we're just showing that it can be done. 
So I like the statement uh, in the book. It says, although we have solved the equivalent one body problem, they made a mistake. A, the book says uh, one dimensional, but this is one body. Although we have solved the equivalent one body problem formally, practically speaking, the integrals are usually quite unmanageable. And it's often more convenient to perform the integration in some other fashion. So, physicists and mathematicians have been performing these integrals in many ways for the past um, 200 years or so. So we're going to see a few cases, uh, but first we're going to um, get a feeling for these equations. <coughs> So we had these <clears throat> as one of the equations uh, of motion. So we can move this one to the other side, right? So we'll get L squared divided by MR cubed. This will be MR dot dot. So if we let F prime of R be equal to this, then we can rewrite this whole thing as mr dot dot equals f prime of r. So um, this guy is an effective force. So this way we can um, reduce the problem even further to a one-dimensional problem. <coughs> so it only depends on R. L squared divided by M R cubed is equal to M R theta dot squared which equals uh, M R squared theta dot squared divided by R and this part over here what is it? Well, it's the velocity tangential to r um, squared. Divided by r. So this is a mass. What is this? Velocity squared over r. 
what are the units? Acceleration. Okay. So, what kind of acceleration is this? Centripetal. Centripetal? Yes? What about centrifugal? Are centrifugal forces real? Sure. Some of them are. So if you are um, if you put like a bowling ball on the bed of a truck and then you drive the truck and you, know, you start row and you start turning, then you create this force that you know just comes from the fact that the frame of reference is not inertial, right? It's a centrifugal. Um, that one is not a real force, but this one, you know, we'll see that it's actually quite real. So, the effective force is the regular force due to the potential and the centrifugal.